Come on, if you're comfortable with this, come on, every hand up in this place, side to side, front to back. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, thank you for meeting us here today, Jesus. Lord, I pray you do something special in this place, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would take the message today, God, and you would tailor make it. Tailor make it exactly for what somebody's going through, Lord. Lord, I pray today local church would pick up right where we left off last week. That somebody would be ministered to in the name of Jesus. That people wouldn't come here to hear some music and to hear some speaking, but they would come here to encounter you, Jesus. Lord, do in this place what only you can do. And before we go any further, we're going to stop. We're going to pause, and we're going to give you all the glory and all the praise in this place. Come on, church. Can we put our hands together this morning? Amen. We love you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Hey, go ahead. Find a seat. Find a seat. High five three people on the way down. Tell them. Tell them your hair looks so good. Your hair looks so good. Humidity got nothing on you, girl. Let them know. Nothing on you, girl. Nothing. Humidity ain't got nothing on you look good, man. I'm excited to be in church. Everybody doing well? Hey, before we go any further, I think most of us know this, but it is Memorial Day weekend, and our Bible makes it very clear to give honor where honor is due. So on this day, we do what we're supposed to do, what we should do. We stop, and we pause, and we remember the fallen soldiers who paid the ultimate price for us to be here today to worship in freedom. But another thing that we do here at local church is I want to take a moment and honor any of our active or former veterans, military. Come on, if you serve, why don't you stand to your feet? Come on, stand to your feet all across this place. Come on, let's put our hands together, local church. Amen. We love you guys. Love you, love you men and women, man. Seriously, seriously, seriously. Local church stands with our military. Amen. We stand with our country. I'm so excited you're here in church. Everybody doing well? Hey, y'all don't know this. Y'all don't know this. Last night, our load-in team loaded in here, and when we got here, the air conditioning was completely broken. Uh, no joke, it was 90 degrees in this room. We started praying, declaring the blood. And would you believe it? Come on, the AC people came out last night. And come on, it was fixed at 9 a.m. this morning before you got here. So it's cooling off. It feels okay. I'm clapping for that. Come on, we can clap for that. In the name of Jesus. The Church Plant Chronicles just add it to the list. I love making memories with you guys. We're going to look back on these days. So, so much fun. Come on, by show of hands, who here? Come on, you were ministered to last week. Come on, did anybody enjoy last week? My prayer is really to pick up where we left off last week. We're kicking off a new series. And if you're new to church culture, new to how we do church at local, um, there's so much that goes into a sermon collection. Um, And the team has been, I'll say this, they've been bothering me. They've been asking me. They're like, Andrew, what is the next sermon collection? And I kept telling them, give me one more week. I'll let you know. Just give me one more week. And I felt like the Lord made it abundantly clear where we should go last week in the altar. So we're kicking off week one of summertime blues. If you were at pre-launch, I'm talking like seven months ago, I shared some of what I'm going to share this morning uh, with about 50, 55 people. Uh, We're obviously much larger than that now, but as I was preparing for this series, some of the team said, Pastor, if you're preaching in Job, you have to share some of that stuff you shared. I still think about that sermon. So if you were there and you're like, I feel like I've heard maybe that point before, you're not going crazy, you certainly have. But here's how this sermon is going to go, okay? This collection is going to go seven weeks. We're going to knock out the first three weeks. We're going to hit pause on Father's Day, okay? We're going to let Job get some Gatorade on Father's Day, okay? I'm going to preach a little message on Father's Day for the fathers, encourage us. And then we're going to finish up the final four weeks. Does that sound good? Cool. People always ask me, they're like, Andrew, where do you get your sermon series, your sermon ideas? Where do you get, how do you, and I would say this, 95% of the things that we preach from this stage, we talk about at crew, come from personal quiet time of mine, personal quiet time of the team. I'll take stuff to the team and they'll be like, you have to share that. Um, but how many of you know, I'm a little bit of a loose cannon, so sometimes I'll share stuff with the team. They're like, you cannot share that, okay? So, um, but, but we brought this to the team. They're like, man, you have to share some of that. So if you're like me, come on, do we have anybody who grew up in church? Wave at me if you grew up in church. I'm a little bit of a mutt spiritually, okay? 
Um, I grew up kind of uh, in the charismatic Pentecostal Church of God kind of style of church. Was actually there it is. I always shout, don't you? Um, and then. Um, <laughs> And then after that, I kind of was like, really got fired up, called in the ministry, believe it or not, in a Southern Baptist church. And uh, I've been really everywhere, now planted a non-denomination New Testament church. But if you come from church and you're like, Andrew, like the church is growing, we're so excited. We might not have AC, but we're doing so much for the Lord. And you're jumping into a sermon collection in Job. First time I opened my Bible, I was like, the book of Job. What is this? The book of Job. Some of you are like, I need one of those right now. <laughs> Amen. That's a good book for our country, right? Um, the, book of, the book of Job. And you're like, Andrew, are you okay? Does pastor need a hug? Is he okay? Even if you're unchurched, chances are you're at least familiar with the things that come along with Job. Maybe you've heard like, you're such a Job. You're such a, oh, that was your Job season. I want to be kind, but I want to be firm when I say this. Christians, you can write this down. Everybody, you can write this down. When Job is preached, I think oftentimes it's preached wrongly. We don't preach it right. We preach the first two chapters and then we're done. We talk about all the terrible things that happened to Job, the Job, uh, just, just a poor, pitiful Job, and this is crazy. And then y'all do understand, there are 40 more chapters in Job. There's 42, there are 40 more chapters. So I was reading through the book of Job, prepping for today, prepping for this series, and I came across a verse. Y'all, it knocked me out of my chair, okay? I need y'all to write this down. This is the series. This is where we're going. It's found in Job 42, verse 12. I don't care if you've been in church, if you haven't been in church, chances are there might be some people here. You've never known this about the story of Job. Ready? The Lord blessed, all the terrible stuff happened, right? The worst day ever, right? Uh, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life, more than the former. We know Job was blessed, but you're telling me he blessed the second half of his life more than he blessed the first half of his life. I read that and I circled that and I underlined that and I said, I want that. I want that. I want to be blessed. Come on, anybody want to be blessed at local church? I want to be blessed. There's always those super Christians that are like, I don't know. I don't know if I will. Shut up, okay? I want your blessing, okay, Becky? I'll take your blessing. I want the blessings of God on my life. I want that. Not only do I want that for me, I want that for you. I want that for every single person who walks through the doors at local church. Every single single person, every single teenager, every single married couple, every single grandparent. I want you to be blessed. This whole series, seven weeks, I'm going to talk to you on this idea of how to get God, how to live a life that honors God and lives a life of blessing. Pause. Hold up. Time out. Some of you are like, mm, mm, mm. I knew, I knew, I didn't like this guy. I knew it. Knew I didn't like this guy. I came in here with one foot on the brake. Now I got two foots on the brakes and two foots, there it is. Two feet on the brake. <laughs> I'm from Savannah. Um, two feet on the brake and I can't believe it. He's about to start selling prayer hankies in a minute and they're going to bring out a gold. I'm not selling you anything this morning. As a matter of fact, this series, I'm going to walk you through some of the most difficult sermons I would guarantee you've ever heard in your life. But I believe if you apply these things, God will give you a life of blessing. You ready for week one, Summertime Blues? I wanna preach this morning to the person who was ministered to last week, okay? Last week, if you were ministered to, hey, this is part two, draw a line in your notes, get ready, it's week one of Summertime Blues. I know the church is growing, I know it's exciting, I know when the band plays, my goodness, it's so loud, everything's so good. But I want to minister this morning to the person who maybe can't, can't worship out loud yet. Can't raise their hands in worship without feeling a little bit odd. They're not quite ready to press into church like some of you crazy people are, okay? They're not quite ready for that. And the reason they're not ready for that is because damage of what happened to them in church prior. I don't know when it happened, I don't know what happened, but I wanna to preach to the person today, I don't know if it was last year, two years ago, three years ago, your faith was fractured. Come on, if you're taking notes, I've titled my sermon, Fractured Faith, Fractured Faith. Lord, we love you, bless this time together, do what only you can do, in your name, amen and amen. Just by show of hands, show of hands. Who here, be honest, we're in church, you can't lie, you've ever been like, 
I'm talking next level mad. Come on, wave at me. You've been next level mad. Yeah, you have. I see you, girl. You have. Come on, if you're not raising your hands, you're a liar, okay? All the, all the, all the single people are like, I'm mad, okay? Um, right? Come on, you've been so mad before. All the parents, come on, we've had like two days of summer, and some of you are already like, these kids need to go back to school, okay? Can't do this, okay? <laughs> um, I really wanted to know this one all morning. Who here, by show of hands, you've been so mad that you hit something or someone? Where you at? Woo! A lot of violent people at local church, amen. Security's got an eye on you, amen. Come on, one more time. Who, who's the people you've hit something before? You've hit something or someone, wave at me. Call them, what'd you hit? A wall. <laughs> the guys do that, don't you? Like we hit walls, we hit doors, and we break our hands, and it never hurts the wall, and it always hurts us. You hit like a stud or something, and you're like, what am I doing? Okay, who here, you've ever been confused, frustrated? Come on, wave at me. Yeah, all the married men. All the married men, praise God. <laughs> all the dating men. All the single men, all the men, honestly, all the men, okay? Just, I walked in the bedroom the other day. Y'all, really? I walked in, 78 pillows on the bed, Naomi, 78. We sleep with like, I mean, I like a lot of pillows, so I have like six, but like 78? Is this necessary? It's so confusing. Super frustrated, I was super frustrated. My kids the other day, they came in. Y'all, they had, I don't know if parents, you know this, my kids had red slime. You know this, they make slime. It's all over the kitchen floor. We have a no slime policy at the Moore house. As of this week, I said, go play with the slime in the woods. They said, dad, we don't have woods. I said, keep walking. You'll find some woods. We don't play with slime in the Moore house anymore. Hey, uh, don't raise your hand on this one because I know some people would tell the truth and I know others of you would not. But how many of you have ever been mad, frustrated, annoyed, confused? Don't raise your hand with God. I'll speak for me. I know I have. My goodness, I've been confused. My goodness, I've been frustrated with God. But we don't talk about that in church, do we? I'm not supposed to talk about that in church, Andrew. You're supposed to come to church, keep your head down, be fake, go home, pretend everything's okay. Right? It's good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Y'all, I'm a pastor. If you don't know that, I'm like a, I say this from time to time, I'm like a professional Christian. And there's been times in my life where I've looked up at God and been like, really? In my ministry, within the last 18 months, really, God? This is how you're going to treat me? This is how this is going to go down? Come on now, don't judge me. You thought it. You might not have said it, but you thought it. Come on, single people. You know you've been frustrated. Come on, God. For the love, God, she's married. Come on, God, she's married. <laughs> she, I can get married, okay? Right? We've been frustrated with God. And here's what I know about everybody in this place when you're frustrated. You'll come to church, and you'll see others press in, and you'll see others respond in worship, and you'll see others respond to altar invitation, and you'll sit back waiting for that moment for you, but you never move and you never feel it because your faith is fractured. Here's what I know about everybody with fractured faith. Write this down. You are tempted to give up. Last week we talked about the dot, dot, dot. You can get in that dot, 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 and you're tempted to give up. I remember being in college doing calculus homework. Y'all, I threw my textbook across the dorm. Okay, pray for your pastor. I threw my textbook. I think God let Satan create two things. Ready for him? Math and cats. Clowns is a third, okay? Right? Like, I just, it, it was frustrating. We all have, anybody have a dad that worked on cars? Come on, that worked on cars? Everybody. Um, my neighbor, my neighbor, my friend, his dad worked on cars. And I can remember his dad being in their garage under the hood and working, and he would get so mad, he'd lean his head up and hit his head on the hood and throw the wrench. I was nine years old. That's where I learned how to cuss. And he would throw the wrench, and he would do the whole thing. He was frustrated, and when you get frustrated, you're tempted to give up. I'm done with this. Fooey on this. I ain't doing this anymore. Here's a sermon in a sentence. I want you to write this down in case you have to leave early, in case you got to uh, whatever, in case your kid, they get paged out because your kid sets local kids on fire. I need you to understand this, okay? Write this down. Never give up on the God who has never given up on you. I, I, never give up on the God that has never given up on you. It's Galatians 6, 9 that says, do not grow weary 
and doing good works. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. AKA, don't give up on the God who's never given up on you. I wanna give you five things today, five things from the life of Job, five lessons from the life of Job, five things you've gotta understand if you're here and your faith is fractured. Five things. Some of you, really simple teaching today. Some of you, you need this sermon. Really bad. You, you need it bad. This is part two for you from last week. Others of you, you might not need it right now, but I would write it down. I would file it away. I'm not trying to be negative, but I just know this being alive for 31 years. I heard somebody say this and it stuck with me. You're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or heading towards a storm, and you don't even know it. You ready? Five things we got to get out of this text. Five things. Today is the first week. We got to get on first base for this series, okay? Number one, the first thing you got to understand out of the life of Job. You ready for it? Write this down. Life is hard. Ain't it? Life is hard. Life is difficult. You screaming, my life is hard. It's like a football player screaming, they're trying to tackle me. Yes, they are. Have you ever noticed nobody ever plans for a difficult life? Nobody ever plans. Nobody ever schedules a tragedy. Nobody's ever gotten a phone call from God. On a Monday, hey God, what's up? everything's good? Cool, cool. Oh, we gotta do what this week? We gotta fit in a car wreck? Ah, oh, can't do Monday, I can do Thursday, right? Broken leg, I can't do a broken leg. I gotta preach Sunday. I can do a broken peak. That's not how it works. Nobody schedules these things. Life is hard. Y'all, Disney World can't even paint this lie. Like, just by show of hands, parents, did you, anybody parents, wave at me, you gotta be honest, you've taken your children, I'll just say, to a theme park. Wave at me, you've taken your children to a theme park. Did you have fun? No! <laughs> no, you didn't have fun. But I've learned. It was 105 degrees, you did not have fun. But I've learned. Parents don't go to Disney World so they have fun. They go to Disney World so their kids have fun. Nah, man, it was so fun, it was so chill. No, sir, you were high, okay? It was not fun. It was super hot. You did not have fun. But Disney can't even sell it, y'all, but you've seen the commercials, haven't you? The family's holding hands, and they're running down Main Street, USA. The castle's in the background, and they're holding hands, and they're running in slow motion, right? Their hair is perfect. There's no crowd, it's just them and the mouse. It's just them and Mickey Mouse, right? And the family runs and they embrace Mickey and they hug and they throw their heads back and they laugh. What they don't tell you is it costs $100 a minute to hug that mouse, <laughs> right? You're sweating, you don't wanna be there, life is hard. All right, Job, we should talk about the Bible. Job chapter one and two is where we're gonna be today. For sake of time, I'm not going to read you the story in its entirety. I would encourage you to go read it on your own. Take you, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, ten minutes. That's some homework for you today. Read Job 1 and 2. But the Bible describes Job as blameless, upright, fears God, and shuns evil. Job's a man of God. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears the Lord. He shuns evil. I translate that. He's a man of God. He hates the Dallas Cowboys. Amen. He, he's a man of God. He, he, he's a good guy. He's a godly man. He loves his family. He loves his wife. Him and his wife have 10 children. Come on, somebody. They love each other. Evidently, something's, something's working in the marriage, okay? Um, he's got 10 children. He loves his, his kids so much that his kids, when they would go out and throw parties or celebrations, he would wake up early and offer sacrifices to God just in case one of his kids sinned. Job was a man of God. He was rich. In this culture, being rich would have been an indication that you are blessed by God. But in the meantime, Job is there and God and Satan start having a conversation. Bible says he's roaming the earth and some of the angels come to check in with the Lord and Satan, Lucifer, he tags along with them. Some of you should write this down. There is always more going on in your life behind the scenes than you think. There is always more happening in your life than you think. And he's, I've been rolling, I've just been trying to tempt people and, 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 and you know, I've been kind of doing that. And, and then in Job chapter one, verse eight, um, the Lord tells Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? Time out. I love the Lord a lot, like a lot, a lot. I love Jesus. Um, 
but I don't ever want to love Jesus so much that he begins to brag on me. Because I saw what happened to Job, right? Have you considered my servant Andrew? I don't want that for me, okay? I don't want that. Wherever that is, I want to be like right here, right? Now, you know, I love the Lord, but not that much, okay? So I want to be right there. He's like, yeah, of course he loves you. He's blessed. You've blessed him. He's got everything. Of course you love him. And here's the scary part. Satan's right. Any fool can come to a local church and worship with both hands in the air when life's good. Come on, any fool can get here with your notepad and take notes on a sermon when everything's great. When life is good, it's so easy, but come on when your faith is fractured. He says, he says well, hey, in verse 11, he says, here's what we'll do. Um, if you'll let me, if you'll let me take away all that stuff from him, if you'll let me remove all the blessings that you've placed on his life, if you'll let me fracture his faith. Don't miss this. Time out. Listen to me. Satan had to ask God for permission. This is not a stalemate. They are not duking it out to see who's going to, no, 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 no. He had to ask God for permission. God has no rival. He has no equal. We just sang about it, right? So here we go. He says, fine, I'm going to remove the hedge of protection and you can do whatever you want. Y'all, and Job has the day from hell. But he loses his wealth. He loses his livestock. He probably files bankruptcy. His stock market stuff crashes. Uh, a natural disaster occurs where the house falls and kills all of his children. This is a man of God. Kills all of his children. Write down the second thing we learned. We, we got to understand this. We must make a decision. We must make a decision. This happens to Job, and Job makes a choice. He's, he's a man of God. All this bad stuff happened, and he makes a choice. Watch what happens in Job chapter 1, verse 20. Watch what Job does right here. At this, Job got up. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. Had a Brittany moment. Shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return to God. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Praise be the name of the Lord. Y'all, I just, I, I got a hunch here. I can't prove that I'm right. You can't prove that I'm wrong. My senses tell me Job didn't want to worship God. I don't think this happened and Job was like, you know what? I just want to worship God. Amen. I just want to worship God. I don't know why Job would do that. Okay. I hope he doesn't do that. That'd be incredibly disappointing if he did that. Okay. So, um, but Job is like, he didn't want to worship God. This was not a feeling. I have a feeling this was a conscious mental decision. Local church, there will be times in your life where all hell breaks loose, where your children make mistakes that are unthinkable, that you can't even believe you raised them that way. There will be times in your life where, where, where the marriage isn't there and it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. It ain't right. And you are going to have to make a conscious decision to praise the Lord. You're going to have to make a decision to praise the Lord. I love feelings. God gave you feelings. I'm not saying your feelings are bad, but can I ask you a question? Do you have control of your feelings or do your feelings have control of you? Because I can see Job in this moment. He loses everything. His faith is fractured and there's people here and you're just like that. And you watch other people get into the presence of God and you watch other people go public and get baptized and you watch all this stuff and you sit on the sideline waiting for a feeling. I came to remind somebody, we don't worship God based off of a feeling. We worship God based off of who he is. And if he never did another good thing for you, he's already done enough. That's why we worship God. That's who he is. I can see Job right here. Job saying, you know what? Come hail or high water, I'm with you, Lord. You can take my house, but you can't take my Jesus. Come on, you can take my relationships, but you can't take my worship. You can take some of this, you can take some of that. Some of you, that needs to get in your spirit this morning. But you can't take my worship. I see Job right there, and Satan returns to the Lord. He's like, man, you're right. Job is the real deal. He loves you. I did all that stuff, and yet he loves you. But, but, but he's healthy. See, if I took his health, if I put him in the hospital, he would for sure curse you. By the way, if I'm Job, I'm like, Lord, you need to quit talking to that guy, okay? Like, this is getting bad for me. Can y'all quit hanging out up there? This is getting really, really, really bad for me. So he takes his health. The Bible says Job goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, uh, Job, you've got every disease known to mankind. 
Like here, he's got, the Bible says he's got boils that break out all over his skin and he's scraping them off and he's in such bad shape. He's in such bad shape that his friends, his friends visit him. Three friends we'll talk about later in this series. By the way, with friends like this, who needs enemies? We're gonna talk about it in the series a little bit. But he, he these three friends visit y'all. And I don't know if you've ever been in such bad shape, sick, that when your friends visit you, they don't even know what to say. They just look at you. I can't make this up. Read the Bible. Job's friends arrive and they look at him for seven days. For seven days. They don't say anything. We're going to talk about his friends later in the series. And then Job's wife shows up. My Lord. His wife shows up. Job! Joby! <laughs> Hey, y'all ever had, side note, you ever had your wife say your name, sir, in such a way that it sounded like a cuss word? You know what I'm talking about? Job! Job, are you still going to worship that precious God of yours? Are you still going to do that? Job's wife had uh, what I like to call RCF. She had a resting church face. She, just, she was just resting church face. Um, some of you will get it later. Okay, so here we go. She had, she had RCF, bad. I've seen it my whole life in church. If you have it, get rid of it, okay? She had a, she had a resting church face. And, and, and Job's like, baby, are you saying, wait, wait, you're asking me if I'm gonna worship the Lord? Are you saying that we only signed up to worship God in the good times? Are you saying that I can't worship God in the bad times? Local church, I have a question for you this morning. Is your worship predicated on what the Lord does for you or is your worship predicated on who he is? Come on, can you not worship God through some tears? Come on, can you not worship God through some bad times? Can you not worship God through some seasons of singleness? But I love it right here because Job says, you know what? Like he gets the spirit of Joshua on him. For me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I remember reading this for the first time and I was like, wait a minute. I can see God and Satan up there chit-chatting and just kind of talking away. And he's like, I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill his kids. I'm going to take his money. And I can see God and Satan standing there. And God goes, you know his wife's still there, right? I can see Satan laugh and look at him and go, I know, I'm going to leave her, okay? I'm going to leave her, you know what I'm saying, right? I read it and I was like, come on, Lord, you could have at least killed her and left the dog. What is up with this, right? But as I was studying for this, come on, we got to show some grace to Mrs. Joe. We got to show some grace to her. She just lost everything she's ever known. She just lost all her children to, to, to a crazy, horrific circumstance. She's watching the life she knew slip out of her hands. She's watching her husband die a slow death. She is watching her husband lose his mind. She is quite literally in the story with Job, and she has fractured faith. I feel bad for Mrs. Job. Now, if you're from a church background, this is typically where the sermon ends, right? Job had a hard life, and your life is nothing like Job's life. So suck it up and do better. Let's pray and go home, right? Anybody ever heard that sermon? Come on, you've heard that sermon. I know I have. I've heard that sermon before, right? Listen, I'm not here this morning to outpain your pain. Y'all know that person that always has to outpain your pain? No matter what kind of pain you have, they have to tell you how much worse theirs is. If you don't know who that person is, you're that person. <laughs> Nobody likes you, okay? <laughs> Teasing, <laughs> maybe, uh, right? Like you could go to work tomorrow and be like, hey, I, uh, Got a bandaged up finger. I uh, got this knife. The, remember the, the Ginsu knives? I was out. Was, we were doing burgers, so I was chopping up tomatoes. Then I went outside and saw the bumper on my car. You know those knives you can do both with? And then I came back in, and I was chopping tomatoes. And oh, my goodness, I sliced my finger. You wouldn't believe it. I sliced my finger. Had to go to the ER. Got three stitches in my finger because I was cutting tomatoes. Took a break. Did the car. Came back in to cut some more tomatoes. And somebody will look at you, and they'll go, wow, that's great. But that's not pain. You're like, I mean, it, got stitches. It's pretty bad, right? No, they'll say, that's not pain. You see that leg? It's not my real leg. I was in the Amazon with a backpack full of Bibles trying to reach unreached people groups for Jesus. And it started thundering and storming and a tree fell. And when the tree fell, it pinned me against the earth. And when it pinned me against the earth, it got my leg, right? And then you wouldn't believe it, man-eating ants came after me. And when the man-eating ants, the Lord revealed himself and spoke to me. And I took out my pocket knife and I sold my leg off. That's pain. You know these people, right? That's pain. There's people here today, listen to me. Your pain's emotional pain. 
Your pain's emotional. I saw it last week in the altar. There's emotional pain represented. There's abuse in the house. Come on, there's miscarriages represented. There's deaths of people close to you. And I'm not here to tell you that that's okay. I'm here to tell you life's hard. Ready? There, there's financial pain. That's a real one right there. There's financial pain. It's all you think about at night. Come on, I want to start a life with this person, but how am I going to start a life with this person? Are we ever, if we ever have kids, are we going to be able to provide for these kids? And, and there's people in the, in the room right now where the numbers aren't adding up. There's financial pain. There's relational pain. Your marriage feels like it's on the rocks. The best friend you thought you was going to be with forever, come on, ride or die, you haven't spoken to. Come on, there's physical pain. You were completely healthy. You went to the doctor. Come on, now you're like, how did I get here? Come on, there's, there's, there's all these pain. And here's what church has done. The church at large, and listen to me, this is going to be a bit controversial, but I need you to stay with me. The church has narrowed down our walk with the Lord and struggles we encounter to little stupid phrases that aren't true. We'll put them on t-shirts. We'll put them on coffee mugs. We'll amen them. They always get a good applause in church. And there's one that if you're struggling today, I bet you've been told. And I came to tell you this morning, it's not true. You ready for it? This is something you've been told. You ready? You're going through hell? Listen to me. The safest place to be is smack dab in the middle of God's will. The safest place to be is in the will of God. That sounds beautiful. That sounds poetic. That sounds amazing. The only problem is it's not true. That's not the safest place to be. If it is the safest place to be, what do we do with Jesus? Who, by the way, was in the middle of the will of God and wound up crucified to a tree. I wrote it like this in my notes. God's will is good. God's will is right. But God's will is anything but safe. His will is good. His will is right. But it's anything but safe. This is local church. I can talk candidly how I want to talk. Um, there's something about me you should know. Um, Naomi hates this about me. But if I'm ever flipping through the channels and I see TV preachers, I can't help myself. I got to watch it. And I'm not saying they're all bad. All TV preachers aren't bad. Just like 99.9% .9 of them are, okay? But the rest of them, they're, they're, they're good, right? It's, you know what drives me crazy, though? It's the health and wealth, guys. You know what I'm talking about? If you'll do this, you'll do this. Come on now, affirmation. If you do this, I'm, I'm perfect health. Come on, financial abundance. That stuff drives me crazy because it's not true. What do you do with Jesus? What do you do with the guys that follow Jesus <clears throat> who all end up being martyred except for John? And they boiled him in oil. Just murder me at that point, okay? Just kill me. What do you do with that? But we've narrowed it down to, you'll never go through anything. Life's going to be okay. Your faith will never be fractured. But watch what the book of John chapter 16 says right here. Watch this. This is Jesus that says this. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will maybe have trouble. No, it says you will have trouble. There will be bad things happen. There will be things you ought not prefer. There will be things that you don't like. Write down another one. God is still God. Come on, life's hard. You got to make a decision because God is still God. Your circumstances do not alter the character of God. God is still God. Question for the people in the house. Are you going to let your circumstances dict dictate your view of God? Or are you going to let your God dictate the view of your circumstances? God is still God. But we choose how we view this. Now, this is it right here. This is the catalyst verses in Job we're getting to. This is crazy because I've heard preachers preach this. And they'll say things like, <clears throat> it worked out for Job because Job was a man of God. <clears throat> he never questioned. He kept, his, he kept his head down. He didn't say anything. You think that because you stopped reading in chapter 2. For, for over 35 chapters... Job and his buddies give the Lord a piece of their mind. Job gets to a point where he actually says this. He says, Lord, if you'd actually come down here and talk to me, come on, somebody, we could work this out. Well, come on, in chapter 38, the Lord does. And Job gets his chance. And here's what he says right here. In chapter 38, he says this. He says, Job, brace yourself 
like a man. Listen, if you get to the point where the Lord speaks to you and he says, get ready, brace yourself like a man, the King James says it like this. He says, gird your loins. I told the creative team, that's gonna be on the back of our next t-shirt, gird your loins. Love that. Father's Day, gird your loins, right? This is insane. He says this right here. And they, they have a conversation. Job was annoyed. Job questioned God. He was angry at God. You know, John the Baptist was the same way. And the Lord said, he's the greatest man. Jesus said, he's the greatest man to ever live. While being locked up, John the Baptist sends a messenger saying, can you ask Jesus, is he still the one or should I look for another? And Jesus gets asked that question. And he goes, who, who asked that? John the Baptist, greatest man to ever live. Um, he just asked if you're still the one you said you were. I know, I heard you the first time. He's the greatest man that ever lived. But you've been told in church, if you question God, if you doubt God, you're not a person of faith. I would actually say the people in the text, if you read the Bible, the people who questioned God the most were the people that God used in a miraculous way. Job comes to his senses in 19 and he starts talking to the Lord and he's like, hey, you're my redeemer. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. <clears throat> Local church, there's a verse in the Bible that if you're going through something right now, somebody has probably told you. But it's a verse that we love to misquote. It's a verse that isn't, that isn't true <clears throat> oftentimes how we use it. And it's Romans 8.28. Can I read it to you? Throw it up there for me. <clears throat> Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So you ever had somebody tell you that? I call it the funeral verse. Something bad happens and people come up to you and they're like, hey man, just want to tell you Romans 8.28. And you're like, if I hear that again, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to whip out another verse on you. The one where Jesus makes the whip and clears out the temple. I'm going to bring that verse out, okay? Don't tell me that verse again. I heard you the first time, right? All things come together for the good. All things come together for the good. All things come together for the good. Church, that's not true. All things come together for the good. That's not true. That's a half truth. Look what it says. That's not what it says. It says that all things come together for the good of those who love him. Well, that's shocking, Andrew. That's disturbing. I hope it disturbs you deeply. All things do not come together for the good. All things come together for the good of those who love him. So listen to me this morning. You're going through hell. Life is tough right now. Listen to me. You love the Lord. I don't know when. I don't know how. But all things will come together for the good. If, he's, if you listen to me, if you're not dead, he's not done. Listen, if it don't look good, it's because he's not done. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I know we serve a God who turned a bloodstained cross into an empty tomb. And I'm believing that people in this place, it is coming. And don't lecture God on how to do it. Just by a show of hands, who here, I, I can't join you in this because I haven't, but who here, you've ever seen one of the like 11 Star Wars movies? Wave at me. You've seen one of the 11 Star Wars movies. Okay, cool, got some nerds, love you. Um, I've never seen any of the Star Wars movies. I gotta be really honest with you. Um, I know, you're gonna leave the church. Okay, praise God, okay. Um, but could you imagine... It, 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 George Lucas is the man who wrote these, directed these, put these on. Could you imagine that if George was here today and I brought George, hey, hey man, what's up, buddy? You wrote these movies, okay? I know there's 11 of them, but I'm going to watch, I don't know, the third one. Is the third one good? I'm gonna watch number three and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna watch 10 seconds of the movie over here in the hallway and then I'm gonna come back out and let you know what I think. And I did that and I came back out and I was like, hey, George, I watched it. Uh, I watched 10 seconds. I know there's 11, but I watched 10 seconds, okay? Um, here's some things I would do different. How crazy would that be? I haven't seen the rest of the movie. I would never do that to George Lucas. But so many of us do that to God. God, if you could do this and you could do this, listen to me. There's 42 chapters in Job. You're trying to put a period at the end of your story and you're in chapter two. He's not done with your life. He's just getting started. Band can join me today. Band can join me. Band can join me. Write down number four. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. As a parent, can we all agree? There is nothing more frustrating than watching your child give up on something that you know they can do. Right? Maybe riding the bicycle. My daughters right now, they're four and seven. And I just, you know, they, they give up and it gets hard. And you're like, but you can do that. 
Come on, you can do that gymnastics cheerleader move. You can do it. But they give up. They give up when, and it breaks our hearts, doesn't it? It's like, why would you do that? Listen to me. How do you think our heavenly father feels about us? Watch what Paul says in 2 Corinthians right here. Watch what Paul says. He's writing this. This is a man I will tell you about in a second. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles. Wait, I don't know what you're facing, but I do know the man who wrote this was locked up in prison was stoned and ultimately beheaded because he loved Jesus. And he calls his trials light and momentary. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I came to encourage somebody. The challenges that you face today are light and momentary. If you don't quit, you win. It's been about four years ago, four years ago, some friends of uh, mine, we, we ran in this thing called the Tough Mudder. Come on, anybody ever heard of the Tough Mudder? Wave at me if you've heard of the Tough Mudder. Uh, there, there's this 10, uh, 10 ish miles. There's, there's electrocution. There's ice. There's heights. Oh, your pastor is quite brave. Um, there's all these things. And I was getting some advice from a friend of mine who actually is good at these things and loves these things. And he gave me some advice. He said, Andrew, whatever you do, don't stop running. I said, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Can't promise you, but I got it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. He said, don't stop moving. <clears throat> whatever you do, don't stop moving. Y'all. At mile eight, I stopped moving. My leg said, nah, fam, no more, no more, right? I stopped moving. I had to push so hard through the last two miles. I wanna encourage somebody, if you don't quit, you win. But so many times when life gets hard, I've heard it forever. I'm gonna just quit church for a while. I'm gonna just quit church for a minute. I just, I'm taking a, taking a break. You ever heard that? taking a break. I'm in a season of rest. Christians love to say weird stuff that means nothing, right? God's got me in a holding pattern. What are you talking about, sister? Right? I'm just, I'm just resting right now. I'm in a season of rest. I'm not going to go to crew this season. I'm pumping the brakes on tithing. I'm going to chill and I'm, I came to tell somebody if you don't quit, you win. It's my last thought right here. I got to go quick. You got to listen fast last lesson from the life of Job, week one. When God does something for you, he's always thinking of others. You've never seen this in Job, I promise. When God does something for you, when God brings you through a trial, when God encounters, puts you to encounter a storm and you make it through the other side, he always has somebody else in mind. He always does. When you go through trials and you make it out on the other side, he has somebody else in mind. Watch what 2 Corinthians says right here. Watch this. 2 Corinthians says this. Praise to the Lord God, the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God in all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that he comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. He's saying, hey, I don't know what you're going through. I'm going to bring you through it. But here's the deal. When I bring you through it, the same compassion I show you, I need you to show others. Well, Andrew, did Job ever do that? Certainly. Certainly he did. The Bible says this right here. Throw it up for me. It says this in Job 42, verse 16. After all the trials, after everything that was so bad, after, after he, he's blessed double. After this, Job lived 140 years. I bet his story and his community was well known. I wonder how many people Job helped in those 140 years. There would have been people that witnessed the downfall of Job. There would have been people that witnessed, I remember when the home collapsed and your children were killed. I remember when your children died and that. I remember that, Job. I remember that. I wonder how many people Job ministered to. I wonder how many times Job grabbed the mic at church and said, I just got to testify for a moment. The Lord's been so good to me. I wonder how many people he helped. I wonder how many people he sat down with who were having to bury their child because he had buried 10 of them. I wonder how many people who had lost all their friends, Job said, I've been there. I wonder, said, when the marriage was on the rocks and he said, we were there. I wonder how many people Job helped. I would imagine it was countless. The Lord says, hey, I'm gonna bring you through it, but I got others in mind, here's the deal. The same compassion I show to you, I need you 
to show to them. The point I'm making is Job had no idea the shadow of grace that would be cast on the people's life because of his trials. We're talking 4,000 years later still about this guy. And it's connecting with your life in 2024. I'm not a history buff, but I want to end with a little story. You can't go look this up on your own time. On April 6th, 1962, in Tennessee, there was what's referred to in history as the Battle of Shiloh. The Field of Shiloh, the Battle of Shiloh. Confederate General Johnson led a surprise attack on Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Over 100,000 men are in this war. One of the most gruesome blood, I mean, just terrible, terrible, terrible. It was bloody, 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 just a bad, bad. It's known as one of the most gruesome battles ever. Over 23,000 men lost their lives. Laying out in the middle of the field of Shiloh, waiting for somebody to see them. Is anybody gonna see me? This wasn't much, 1860s. Is somebody gonna see me? Is somebody gonna help me? That war is remembered as one of the most gruesome wars ever. But can I tell you, you gotta look this up. This is true. It's also remembered for a mysterious phenomenon that happened that night on the battlefield of Shiloh. In history, you can write this down. It's referred to as the angel glow. The angel glow. That these men that were, that were laid out in the field of Shiloh, hoping somebody would come help them. What history says is they noticed that their wounds as the sun went down, their wounds begin to, what they refer to as glow, a bluish green. And for hundreds of years, people could never figure out why did those men, why did their wounds glow? And I'm not trying to make you sick this morning, but this is what, this is what they said. 2001, two young boys in high school, their mom was a microbiologist, they figured it out. Bill Martin and John Curtis, I'm not trying to make you sick, but they said, that that day in that soil, there would have been insects. And insects, they had a bacteria inside of them called uh, luminescence bacteria. And, and they would come up out of the soil and when they would get on or inside the wounds of these men, they would release a bacteria. A bacteria that some science I don't understand would begin to heal the wounds and also make the wounds glow. The doctors couldn't figure it out. This is crazy. How are these men, their wounds are glowing. Their, counter, their counterpartners in this that, that had wounds, but they weren't glowing. Their recovery weight was lower. Everything was worse. But the men that had the bacteria that was acting as an antibiotic, look it up. The Bible says they had a faster rate of recovery. Their wounds healed faster. Everything was better. I wrote it like this in my notes. I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I'll preach anything. Come at me, okay? They survived because of the glow. Here's what I'm asking. I got wounds in my life. I've got things the Lord's led me through that my God, I would never walk through again in a million years. But Lord, I just don't want any old wounds. I want wounds that glow in the dark. I want wounds that when people look upon my life, they say, yeah, 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 I remember that guy. I remember that that was like that. And I remember that this was like that. But his wounds glow in the dark. When people look upon me, something's released. When people look upon you, something's released into their life. I wrote it like this. Only a divorced person can give the necessary grace and understanding to a person going through a divorce. Only a, di a divorced person could do that. You're here, you've been divorced, let it glow in the dark. Let it glow. Only a person who's been through abuse and rape and you've been taken sexually advantage of, I know it hurts, but my God, let it glow in the dark. Because there's somebody in this place, I guarantee you, that's walking through it and they're just looking for somebody that's got a wound that will glow in the dark. You come from a shattered family. Listen, there are teenagers in this place. There's young adults in this place. Their families are shattered into oblivion but there's people in their 40s and 50s, you've come out of the other side. Why don't you let it glow in the dark? Come on, why don't you get that point in your spirit that when God brings you through something, he's always thinking of others? I'm gonna end with this. He said, hey, I'm gonna bring you through it, but show the compassion to everybody else. Can we stand to our feet all across this place? I was praying this week, Lord, how do you close a sermon like this. After last week, how do you close this thing? I don't even know how to close this thing, Lord. 
I just pray and we sing or what, what do we do? And I'm a preacher, so I, he called me weird. I don't, I don't care. I said, Lord, give me a sign. Lord, give me a sign. Show me a sign. And I don't know if we have a picture of it, but I told the team to look it up, but I can't. Some of you will know what this is. Uh, Naomi and I were eating at a restaurant here in Savannah. And it was kind of like boat nautical themed. And there was a flag on the wall and I wrote down what the flag said. It said, it said, don't give up the ship. There, that's, that's, that's the flag. It said, don't give up the ship. I said, that's weird. I don't even know what that means, but I like it. Don't give up the ship. Sounds like some Father's Day merch. Don't give up the ship. I can't make this up. We went home and we were watching TV. It wasn't a Christian show to my knowledge, so don't leave the church, but we were watching Terminal List. And I can't make it up. The same flag. So I looked it up. I was like, what is this? Finally, I figured it out. James Lawrence, War 1813. It was his famous last words. The Navy still uses this phrase. And they say, at all costs, don't give up the ship. He was shot. He was wounded. He was grappling a fatal injury. And his last words were, don't give up the ship. And I was going to come to church today, and I was going to shout, don't give up the ship. And I was going to get off the stage and get married to people's face and say, don't give up the ship. I was going to tell our kids team to tell the kids, don't give up the ship. But I got to thinking, I still don't know what it means. I can't say that. I don't know what that means. But I think I got it. For the person who's going through something right now, all hell's broke loose in your life. You got a Job season right now. I said, don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up. Lord, what are you saying? Don't give up the ship. Oh, I got it. I got it. Don't give up the struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't give up the the struggle. Yeah, yeah. Don't give up the struggle. The struggle has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you're going through. Don't give up the ship. Don't give up. The struggle has its. The struggle has its purpose. Don't give up the ship. I don't know what you're going through today, but I want to encourage you, don't give up the ship. The struggle has its purpose. I don't know why your marriage is the way it is today, but don't give up the ship. I know it's hard to raise kids in the house of God. Don't give up the ship. Keep fighting. Heads bowed, eyes closed, all across this place, all across this place.